Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to my talk. Okay, right. So, this is going to be about event stores and Postgres. So, as I've come to realize, event stores is not just confined to the world of the database. It's actually quite a rather high up architecture. So, but I'll be trying to keep my focus to the database side and then trying to, you know, kind of like work through my experiences and show you a bit of what I found. Okay? Cool. Cool. So, hello. I'm Antoni. Telemarketers call me Chris. Um, I'm currently working at uh, Goodex Software slash Quant. We do medical software, kind of like practice keeping software that doctors use and, well, they try to use it. Mostly the clerks and the, you know, wait staff do most of this stuff. Cool. Um, currently doing my degree at UNISA. And, you know, I like to think that I know things. So, you know, all that stuff. Um, yeah, so I've been working for about seven years now. And two years back, I went to Cape Town, had an opportunity there to work for EOH. And uh, I met a tech lead there that introduced me, well, we were going to work on a new project. And he introduced me to, well, not introduced, he kind of said, cool, we're doing event store, go read up about it tonight. Okay, definitely not something you can read up in one night. Um, I've tried this three different ways and I think I'm starting to not suck at it. So, let's start with some humble pie. Event stores are cool when you think about them. They're just kind of, there's no cookie cut way to implement the event store. So, I think we're gonna go through some basic ideas but um, unless you're doing a Greenfields thing, it's probably going to need a whole lot of panel beating to work in any kind of solution. Great. Okay. Cool. So, spoiler alert, this is what an aggregate table looks like. Um, so, what you want to do is you actually want to capture as much important information as you can, but also leave it kind of like ambiguous, so it's open for reuse. I didn't scroll, no, great. And um, so you really wanna, I think I left out in the next one, you'll see I actually left out some data that I'll point out. But it's, it's a very simple, very light kind of, this is only one of the many three tables there are. Um, it's very light, very, but these tables can get big. I've heard that possibly what you can do a strategy is by making a table more on the event side per aggregate or aggregate type so that you can just kind of like have them smaller instead of bunching all your events into one store. Okay, so this is a command table. If you're interested in storing commands, this is always uh, interesting information, um, which is actually kind of like you have your aggregate ID, which links back to your aggregate, which is a business object but we're going to get back to that now. Um, and then the command type. So this is just basically a plain string name that you can replay. This is actually for replaying so that you know kind of, so you don't have to go dig in the body for, you know, that we had to talk about how digging in JSONB is suboptimal. Great. Okay. And then here's the events. This is now actually your the cream of the crop, as they say. And um, here, so here you want to actually make sure that, and this is always going to be hard to predict future needs, but uh, this is an attempt in trying to at least make sure that current data doesn't suck in the future. Um, and yeah, I was also thinking I could have actually added a user column here just to, you know, see where this event um, originated from. Uh, but yeah, you really want to make sure that when you you get that data, it's nice. And um, I saw a talk here actually last year. Um, somebody was talking about data science and how 
from a business perspective, there's a great need, or well, at least from a data scientist perspective, there's a great need for clean, clean data to do analytics with. And I think this is definitely a structure that will, you know, cut out some of the garbage and, you know, keep the good stuff. Where's my cursor? Right there. Okay, cool. So, I'll just, sorry, man, I just quickly want to tab here. So this is basically what an event looks like. Um, you have your, you know, your reference key, you have your sequence number, this is basically a versioning, um, versioning of your aggregate and, you know, applying these things in sequential number, um, the type here, and then the body. I'm going to, in the next slide, I'll make this a bit bigger. And yeah, this poll order is basically just a serial key that just keeps on incrementing. And um, this is the body of the event. Now, my solution is a Python-specific one. So, but I mean, Python-specific cut out. You're basically just going to lose this. This was just cute because then I could rehydrate my classes. Um, but this is actually one you want to capture. You don't want to capture too much irrelevant stuff. You want to break your uh, events quite granular so that you only capture the essence of what state change actually occurred. Um, so yeah, you don't want to duplicate the entire state of whatever, you know, you actually, it's just, this one, for instance, is tab closed. So we close the tab by paying the amount. And that's that. That's all we capture in this event. Great. So, the aggregate. So, an aggregate is a, <coughs> is a, a dynamic business object. And it's always, this is one of the hardest parts, I think, of event sourcing, is you have to think in a domain-driven development uh, mindset where you identify a key business object um, without having it like a tangible one. So in my case, um, in the uh, use case we're going to get to, it's just like a, you know, opening a tab at a cafe. And I identified that a tab, as in a bowl, actually covers the entire process from the customer coming to the establishment, placing his orders, you know, receiving it, and the wait staff and the chef, you know, preparing the food and serving it up until paying the bill. Everything has to do with the tab and then the interactions and events that apply to this tab. So the aggregate is never really, there is no solid form it can take, but instead it evolves, the state transforms with each applied event. So when, you, when the tab has been opened, all we really know is the table number, maybe the wait staff. Then as you order drinks, you know, you get some items, coffee in this case, to serve. It starts getting added onto this. As you order food, you know, this gets added for the rest uh, the chef to go prepare and then the wait staff can maybe you know serve the drinks and um, you know so this thing is never the aggregate is never really a static thing but more an evolving entity that as you apply events to it uh, you know really starts to take shape and I think this is also kind of a uh, you know there's no what's that word getting caught in corners or getting pushed back into a corner because, you know, it's not breaking or it, the structure, you know, limits it. I think it's uh, quite dynamic in the good way. Okay, and then there's food served and then closing the tab and uh, being a horrible tipper at that. Okay, great. So, this is the aggregate, basically. Um, this is an evolving thing, and it's that's why you, you store your business, you really store the data for your aggregate in the history of events. Now, domain-driven design. There are so, sorry, man, I went a bit crazy with the PowerPoint animations. Okay, so we have to approach event stores and event sourcing with a DDD mindset, where, because we have, what we get to is we get a divide between uh, the business requirement 
and then then you know IT trying to implement this business requirement or at least you know sa uh, satisfy the requirement and sometimes we get lost you know in translation where business says no but we want better profits and IT says yeah but we don't code profits we code systems so we want what we want is we want a ubiquitous language where a business person and an IT person can sit around the same table and speak the same language. So when we talk about a tab, you know, everybody knows what a tab is. When we order a drink, everybody knows what a drink is. It's not, and this is something else, is I think we also get caught in our um, CRUD, uh, create, read, update, and delete mindset, um, where we try to think in terms of a table where you you don't add something, you insert it, and you update it, and then you delete it when you're done. Where uh, DDD takes a different approach, where it's, it's basically an aggregate moving through the business process, and then appending and appending and appending, almost like accounting, or accountants append to the record. You know, there's no updating the record, there's adding a record, and then let's say you make an erroneous transaction, then you make a correction, and then you make the correct, you know, you don't quickly, oh no, I made 10,000 instead of a million, so let's just update that field. No, that's not. <laughs> you write it back and then you rewrite it. And um, so you want, you want everybody to speak the same language, including in your code, so that, you know, when you tell the dev, hey man, that tab's not opening, he doesn't have to go think about, okay, but what is a tab now in the system? You know, a tab is a tab is a tab everywhere you go. And then also bounded context, which keeps the tab in the context of, let's say, the cafe, the same as the tab in, let's say, the people working at the chain, you know, HQ, at the, you know, the chain restaurant. They might have a different perspective of what a tab is. So you want to bind that all to the business, uh, the main problem. Great. And then just to emphasize the importance of how well you need to understand the domain. Um, as Albert Einstein said, you know, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, then you probably don't understand it well enough. So you really, it's one of those 70% planning, 30% implementation things where you really need to sit and figure it out before you even start. Because the moment you start and you realize, no, wait, then, you know, that's all time wasted. Great. Cool. So. Crowd thinking. So, <coughs> crowd thinking, right. So, I'm still, because the system we work with is, I don't, this is something I did as a pet project. So, for me, crowd thinking is the default thinking. I think of tables, I think of updating rows, columns, and we have a history table, but that doesn't really capture intent as well as event sourcing does. So, it does capture some revision of how a table updated, but as I'll prove now, there are many ways to get to a certain state. Um, but yeah, so crowd thinking is more about maintaining current state, where the history or the transition of the state is, it, it comes second. So it's about now. It's about this thing as it is now. And then there are some history tables that you can implement for, maybe some historical stuff, but it's suboptimal great <laughs> and um, so it also clashes with because uh, uh, DDD has some rich semantics um, and the uh, ambiguous language because you don't really talk to accountants or even the chef or the waiting staff and tell them no update the order you tell them you know go change the order or place an order or you know close the tab don't mark or delete or you know, they don't, this is a very technical, you know, CRUD language is a very technical, it's very in the dev space, maybe up, but yeah, after that it kind of gets lost in translation. Okay, great, so here's our use case, just a plain simple one, which is not as simple as I thought it would be, but, um, so here are some events or actions that we're going to go through, it's uh, just starting a new tab, placing food orders, uh, you know, serving the f drinks, 
preparing the food, serving the food, closing the tab. Uh, this is going to be, you're going to get sick of these things. It's going to be a recurring thing. Okay, so let's quickly do uh, analysis. I've already done the analysis. I'm just going to tell you. Um, so we identified the tab as our main aggregate, uh, the thing that we will be interacting with. And then we have, ident now we're going to identify some commands that we can, you know, place against this aggregate. So then just some more animations. Man, that's nice. Great. And, um, but now the thing is a command doesn't alter the aggregate, uh, the state of the aggregate. It's like, uh, it's more a, a question, I guess, than a command, which I, it's not as intuitive as it sounds. But um, so basically we're asking the tab, if I open a tab, what will happen? And then the tab says, cool, then I would have to open the tab uh, with these values, you know, so you're telling the aggregate, listen, I want to do this to you. And then the aggregate says, okay, if you do this to me, then this is what's going to happen. And then you play these events against the aggregate. And then you say, okay, cool. I definitely want to do this. And only then does the state change. So, and um, yeah, so this is actually the part you capture. Uh, the analogy I heard for this is capturing facts. So this is intent. Wait, where's my, there we go. So these are the intent to change state. So I want to open a tab. I want to place an order. Um, but then obviously the tab has to perform its business logic and decide whether this is actually a valid operation. I mean, you can't really order things if you haven't opened a tab or close the tab if there are unserved items. So uh, this doesn't necessarily, this isn't a one-to-one, -one, this is just a very convenient coincidence that they map one-to-one. -one. Uh, but, you know, sometimes a command doesn't even have an event. Um, it Sometimes it will, you know, cause raise an exception uh, in the spirit of, you know, the Zen of Pi. No exception should go, uh, what's the word, Un, unraised, you know, unless it's supposed to. So, you know, raising exceptions is pretty... Pretty important. Great. So, our first command, opening a tab. Again, very simple. You just want to capture the wait stop. You want to capture the table number. The rest will come as it comes. And um, then our event is basically the same. And uh, yeah, so it's usually it's very simple. Well, it looks simple. Um, you just want to make sure that you are capturing relevant data, not really, you know, capture the weather or whatever outside you can, but I don't know, it's going to really bloat up your stuff. Um, and then, yeah, we've got some alternatives, the classic shopping cart where, you know, when you go onto a site, you already have a shopping cart. There's no open shopping cart. I think the first action you can do is immediately add items. And um, let's think even like uh, submitting a talk, you know, like uh, what do you guys think would be the first command or event from uh, like say uh, submitting a talk process. I think I might have just given the answer but yeah so you know submit or talk submitted or uh, requested so you know it's really you want to want to keep it so that when I say the event most people in the domain will immediately understand what we're talking about and we're you know, that just creates a high bandwidth communication between all parties. Okay, cool. And now this is what a CRUD version of, you know, opening a tab would be like. You know, plain insert into a tab, which is perfectly sufficient. Um, but I find that it doesn't really capture that flair of a tab being opened. You know, for all we know, this could be some automated system in the background opening 100 tabs for a reservation which isn't opening a tab, it's, you know, making a reservation. So, you know, there's some semantics that get lost, uh, gets lost this way. And, uh, yeah. So, let's quickly just take a quick recap of all the, you know, uh, structures of how the commands would work uh, or look. So, you know, just each one capturing its own uh, domain-specific or, you know, uh, if a command specific uh, information. 
not really going outside of its uh there we go but, uh, what's that word separation of concern yeah so great 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 and uh, yeah, this is also something um, I recently had a subject in uh, artificial intelligence, and this is definitely something that um, uh, what can I say? It looked familiar to me. Where uh, this is another way to be thinking of uh, event sorting, not so much event stores, is uh, you have a state, and you have a command, and from this, an event or some something will come out of that, and then when you place play this event against the state you know, you will get a new state. And um, this is also, I think this is a great way to have your data structured for, if you want to machine learn or something, maybe get some behavioral patterns. And uh, we were talking about accessibility earlier and how we can actually use AI to improve the usability and stuff of our sites. So this is great. I think um, you're already, you're basically setting up your database to be mined for data. Uh, important, uh, hopefully profitable data. And um, yeah, back to our little card. Um, so, you know, these are events that can happen, how we can go about, let's say you add three items and you check out. So you check out card as three items. Great. But what if, for instance, we add four items, we removed one item and then we checked out. Um, so we're still checking out with three items, but as you can see, there's definitely a difference in the way we got to the three items. Furthermore, let's say here, the guy added three items, he removed an item, added another item, then checked out. Again, only three items were checked out, but what can we say about the way that this transaction took place? You know, why did this guy add four items, then took one out, and then checked out? Maybe... He was on a tight budget. Maybe he couldn't afford all four. Um, maybe on this one, he saw a better deal and then added the thing and then checked out. I mean, there's a lot of use information here that might be going lost if we just only appended the state and then threw away kind of anything else that happened in between. Um, so, yeah. I think there's some serious uh, possibility for... Uh, learning from our own data and the way our own systems work. Okay, there must be some animation here. There we go. So, oh yeah, and also again, you know, coming back to the talk aggregate, um, how a talk would be submitted. Here are some more events, you know, let's say the organizers say, okay, cool, we like your talk, but maybe a little less profanity or, you know, then you go and you change and you can see the whole process of how this talk changed and you can actually run this against multiple aggregates of talks and you can actually see how what the flow is of a general talk and do some analytics on that um, I don't know if you guys want to give any suggestions of any events that could be placed on a talk you know let's say this for instance would what would be better to say um, talk uh, yes no, I can't remember I can only remember the answer anyway the answer is Talk approved, yeah, talk approved or talk rejected. What was the other one? Uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> but that was what I was going to get at. Okay, so, you know, it's kind of cool. You also get intent, you know, it's not just cancelled, it's rejected or accepted. Um, and then, yeah, the rest of how we would go about if we were to use the standard CRUD, you know, let's say we order items, we write into the item table, you know, let's say these drinks are now served, the food is now being prepared, the food is now served, okay, we paid our bill. Um, it's just, that doesn't capture as much semantics. Now, the danger is, of course, the moment you start thinking about this, you want to implement event stores on everything. I've been there, it's not a good route to take. So, you want to really also just implement it at least for a start on domains that you find of import and maybe that need optimization. So if you find that uh, you don't understand why things keep getting in a bad state or you know you want to 
let's say it's a key part of your business, then that's something you probably want to run some analytics on. You probably don't want to do it on like logins or user updates, although that is a candidate. Okay, so the difference here. Um, with event sourcing and event store, you really value, the main focus is in the transition of the state. Um, the data comes afterwards, it can be you know hydrated from the events, just playing them back. As you saw, the aggregate is constantly evolving. Um, so yeah, there are multiple ways. Also, as we saw with the cart aggregate, you know, multiple ways to achieve the same state. But then, you know, what data are you losing in those, you know, uh, different paths that people take? Um, and then also, you know, that uh, event, the current state plus event equals new state, which is something for the machine learning people. I hope there are some of you here. Okay, next time. Great. And um, this is also something I read up. Uh, recently, which I kind of wondered about uh, the GDPR, uh, now that people have the ability to say, okay, cool, delete my data, please. This is going to be kind of problematic when your data has to be built up. You know, the state has to be built up out of data. So then the leading data kind of like breaks states. So uh, a suggestion that I heard for this is, in fact, that you encrypt then all your sourced uh, your event store per user and then once they say cool I don't want you to have my data anymore you just delete the key and it's unencryptable oh, well undecryptable I guess so I'm not sure if that's gonna fly I'm not too read up about the GDPR uh, but yeah so and also uh, event stores work as a uh, write only so this is also fun no appending oh, I mean only appending no changing. Uh, so if you made a mistake, it's good to have a counter event. So, you know, like I shot the guy. Oh, okay, no, wait, I unshot the guy. And then, you know, I shot the bad guy because, you know, bad guys. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so, yeah. Problem is, the short event is still in the event. The shot the guy is still there. Yeah, 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 but then. I can't I can't delete that event now and say no. So then I have to I have to make a a correction. Maybe not unshot, maybe like paying for the funeral or something, I don't know. <laughs> Going to prison. Um great, yeah. So and um also some stuff I heard this is kind of cool for people like into super secure stuff. Um what you can do actually is you can have your event store on a worm drive. Uh I didn't know worm stood for write once, read many. So that's kind of like a cute acronym. But um, a worm drive, and then basically, you know, your events are safe. You know, your data store is safe, unless people obviously write garbage data in there, but they can't alter already. S and um, I also heard that you can maybe do like some encryption based on some timestamps so that it's impossible for the guy to quickly rip out and put in a new worm drive, but Security really isn't my speciality. Um, yeah, great stuff. So what can you hopefully gain from all the effort you put into applying an event store? Um, well, you get, uh, what, which is nice, and I haven't actually been able to do this, uh, temporal state replication. So you can actually view the state of an aggregate at any point in time by just playing over the events up until set time. Um, and then kind of like, because the, the scenario for this is possibly one of the users of the system got themselves into some sort of strange state where it's acting like it's not supposed to act. And it's kind of like hard to replicate this because nobody really captures everything they do up until, you know, it's not like, oh, now I press the button now, oh, I got this error. Luckily, I captured everything I did up until this point. Never. I work in second line support. They don't do that. They just say, I press the button and now it's red. So that's nice for if you want to replay the state of an aggregate, really see where things went belly up. And um, yeah, so that's cool. Uh, event streams as a testing tool. Oh yeah, this is obviously cool. So what you can do is once you have built up your event store and you've made some modifications to how the structure works, what you can do is you can always replay your event store 
um, over the current system to make sure that you still get the effects that you want. So, you know, if for instance, and this also plays into the corner case, let's say there is some strange way you can get, or oh, somebody once got the state into a weird place, then you have that list, you have that store of events that was played, and you can play that again and even keep that as a unit test or uh, integration test um, to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And you know that is a valid use case because it happened. Um, and smoke tests. So you can like run all your events and see what breaks. Just pump it in there. Great. Um, and then also event store as an audit log. Uh, this is kind of cool because you can't really change it. It's append only. So um, I've never been in a situation where somebody audited my data, but I can imagine that, you know, if you can make a report, because this is also nice, you can only imagine the report you want a year from now and uh, basically replay all your data and then generate that report as if you have been capturing that report from the inception. Uh, and you can also play it up to, you can view the report also in specific times. So let's say uh, I wanted to see this report that I thought of yesterday, but I want to see it as if I had asked for it in the beginning of the year, you know, given that your event store has been running for longer than from the beginning of the year, that would be possible. So, I mean, that's kind of cool. Very cool. Great. Okay, so projections. Now, this is actually... Um, for uh, nicety, because not every it's kind of hard to go and check the state from just the event store, and you don't always want to replay. Uh, what they do have is they have uh, checkpoints where if a re rehydration of an aggregate takes too long, you can actually make a state capture and just say, okay, cool, this is a checkpoint. Next time, all the events lead up to this state. So from just take this state and then play the rest of the events. And uh, you can actually put like a threshold and say if the hydration again goes over a certain point, just make a new snapshot and then go from there. Uh, projections is if you want to now actually report on your data. Uh, so most projections uh, examples that uh, I came across were actually more on the system side. So this is kind of like a hacky um, database projection, but I think it's just as valid. Um, so basically what you want to do is let's say... I want to have also a third normal form representation of my event store, right? So uh, basically we're going to get the body, uh, all the stuff I'm going to actually, I'm working in reverse, so this is now actually the final way we're putting it in the table. Um, and this then gets fired, oh no wait, wrong side. Okay, so this then gets fired by a trigger function, and here you can actually list, so this one fires on you know, writing a tab opened event, uh, then it's basically going to get this data. So from here on, you can actually, you know, put a bunch of, if you want to capture, if there's some things you want to report on, if a tab is opened, then you can basically just stuff them all in here. Uh, again, like I said, it's just a kind of like a crude uh, database implementation, but I didn't want this thing to be too theoretical. So, yeah, I think this works nicely if it works. Um, I haven't actually gotten it to work. I think my issue might be here somewhere. And um, yeah, great. So thank you all. I hope this has tickled your interest as much as it's tickled mine. And hopefully next year I'll be able to actually do, my plan was to do a whole Python database, like a whole spread of the thing, but it's actually quite, uh, quite complicated. So this is how far I got this year. So hopefully next year, I'll have more for you guys. <laughs> cool. Um, are there any questions? Cool. Uh, I have a question. Does anybody actually implement an event store in their respective? Oh, you guys have. Is it possible for me to maybe ask them uh, difficulties they've experienced? A lot. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I don't know if I'm the right guy to talk about this. Um, yeah. look, uh, you don't have to tell me the implementation. No, no, it's, 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 uh, it's certainly something that we tried and we tried again mm. and we tried again. And we went through a very steep learning curve of very clever people trying to get wrap their heads around this. Yes, the whole crowd moved from state to 
streaming of events, um, having legacy systems in the background that depend on projections, processing that data. Um, it's huge, it takes a lot of space. Mm. Optimizing it, yeah, it's, it's not just something you jump into because it sounds cool. You have to, um, you know, really, like you, 70, 30, you know, mm. think about this before you go in. But it's worth it, there's obviously benefits, goes well with uh, uh, query command separation. Mm. Um, but yeah, DDD itself isn't something that's just easy. You have to have a lot of yeah. frameworks and things in place. So yeah, it's, it's nice. Um, but easy, no, it's not. Mm. It work. But it does work. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, um, yeah, I would say I think it's hard to implement this also as an afterthought. Uh, and, but unfortunately, we're not all um, lucky enough to work on Greenfield event uh, projects and stuff. And even when it is, like you said, it's uh, quite a steep learning curve. I don't know if you want to start off a new project event sourced on your first try. I think, uh, like you said, there are two, three, 20 times, you know. Anyway, experience is uh, gold, if you learn from it, obviously. Cool. Thank you all. <laughs>